Anna was kind of confused and asked, Are you sure it's for me? A witness said. She came down and spoke to boy B, then said she was going out. Her father Patrick Kriegel told Anna not to be long as she had to study for exams the following week. She answered me back, No, I won't be long. I believe she meant it. I knew from the way she was saying it. Anna gave her father a big smile when she left. He did not know who she had been talking to, but soon learned the boy's name. Mr. Kriegel had forgotten to ask where Anna was going so he looked out the window and saw she was going towards the park. When Anna's mother Geraldine arrived home at 5.20 p.m. she asked her husband where Anna was. He told her Anna had left the house with boy B. What's he doing with Anna? She asked her husband. He has nothing to do with her. Nobody called for Anna because she had no friends, she said. She texted Anna, home now. There was no answer, so Mrs. Kriegel texted Anna, answer me now or I'm calling the police. Mrs. Kriegel then went searching the area, but she couldn't see her anywhere. Mrs. Kriegel later contacted a friend, a retired detective, and he told her to go to the Guardi. Shortly after 9 p.m. the couple went to Lake Slip Garda Station and reported Anna missing. By 10.45 p.m., Garda Connor Muldoon was at Boy B's home, seeking his help in finding Anna. Boy B told Garda he'd called to Anna's home about 5 p.m. and walked with her towards the park. They spoke briefly, he said, then they'd gone in different directions. The Garda thanked Boy B for his help and returned to Lake Slip Garda Station. During the early hours of May 15, Gardy patrolled the Greater Lake Slip area looking for Anna and checking her hangouts, but there was no sign of her. They contacted local hospitals to see if Anna had been admitted and repeatedly rang her mobile, but there was no ringtone. Anna Kriegel they organized with Mrs. Kriegel to get pictures of Anna, and received permission to make an appeal on Anna's whereabouts in the media. There were a number of reported sightings of Anna, including one in Dublin Airport. They were investigated by Gardy, but proved to be false. On Tuesday, May 15, Sergeant John Dunn called a boy B's home, around 9 a.m. Sergeant Dunn said Boy B told him Anna was fond of his friend, Boy A, but Boy A was not interested in having a relationship with her. Sergeant Dunn said Boy B told him he'd walked with Anna to the park, where they met with Boy A. The meeting had been arranged by Boy A to let Anna know he wasn't interested in her, it was alleged. Sergeant Dunn then asked a Boy B's mother if he would retrace with Gardy the route he'd taken with Anna in the park the previous evening. Sergeant Dunn walked the route with Boy B, who pointed out where he and Anna had met Boy A. Boy B showed Sergeant Dunn where he'd last seen Anna. He said Anna went one way, and he and Boy A walked off in separate directions. That afternoon, Sergeant Dunn called to Boy A's home, and asked if he would help Guardy retrace the route Anna walked. Boy B also agreed to walk the route a second time. By now, Anna had been missing almost 24 hours. Sergeant Dunn said he, Sergeant Ong, his hussy, Boy B, Boy A and Boy A's father walked the route together. The two boys were leading them. At one point, the boys took a right turn on a wooded trail and Sergeant Dunn asked Boy B if this was correct as he had previously gone left. Boy B stopped and he stated he went no further than this. Sergeant Dunn said, I observed Boy having a glance, a look at him. Nothing was said, he added, and Boy A denied it. It was then decided to take witness statements from the boys as there were inconsistencies in their accounts. Meanwhile, Boy B was telling a counselor he had been dragged into this mess by Boy A. He didn't clarify what he meant by this mess. The counselor met with Boy B on May 16 to offer him support as she knew he was one of the last people to see Anna. During their conversation, the counselor noticed Boy B mentioned around ten times that he was not the last person to see Anna. He told her he'd walked with Anna to the park, but left before her. The counselor said Boy B told her he had only been trying to do a good turn for a mate by calling to Anna's home and asking her to go to the park to meet Boy A. Detective Garda Gabriel Newton expanded on this further. 
She said Boy B told her Anna had a crush on Boy A and Boy A wanted to tell her he wasn't interested. Boy B said to her they met in the park because Boy A didn't want to be seen with Anna. The counselor also said Boy B mentioned more than once that Boy A had scratches on his body and those injuries had come from an attack in the park. Boy B offered a theory to her that perhaps the men who attacked Boy A had kidnapped Anna. However, the next day, shortly after Anna's body had been found, Boy B told Detective Garda Marcus Rontree he believed Anna had caused the injuries to Boy A. As Gardy were searching for Anna, there was a separate investigation into an alleged assault on Boy A in the park on the same evening Anna went missing. GDA Newton met with Boy A and his parents around 7 p.m. on May 16, and drove with Boy A and his dad to the park where the teen showed her where he said he had been assaulted. GDA Newton said Boy A told her he was knocked to the ground and assaulted by two men. He managed to get up and he kicked one of them in the head. He thought the man was bleeding, and both his assailants ran off. Boy A also gave the clothes and boots he was wearing at the time of the alleged assault to GDA Newton. She had told Boy A and his parents that there might be DNA or blood on the clothes which could help identify the culprits. On May 17, Boy A and his mother went to Garda headquarters, where he spent three hours generating an Evo fit, or computer image, of his alleged attackers with Detective Garda Mairead Crowley. GDA Crowley said Boy A gave a very good description of both his attackers. Meanwhile, Anna's family and friends were frantically searching for her. Guardy from several stations had been joined in the search by over 50 members of the civil defense. Sergeant Declan Burkle was in charge of the divisional search team and on May 17, 2018 his team of four was tasked to search the park where Anna was last seen for any signs of her. The house was in very poor condition, and some of the rooms were in a dangerous condition. There was a lot of debris, as well as ash mountains of rubbish and drink cans. Garda Sean White was in a room at the front of the house when he saw what he thought was either a mannequin or something terrible. The lighting was poor and the room was dark. GDA White took in his surroundings and the smell of dried blood, and realized what he had found. He stepped back, as his procedure, and called out to Sergeant Burkle. Sergeant Burkle walked into the room and saw the body of a female lying on the floor. She was naked except for a pair of black socks. Sergeant Burkle noted blood at Anna's nose and her head was tilted back. There was a ligature or noose around her neck and she had three fingers inside it, as if she was pulling it away. He checked for signs of life, but there were none. Glenwood House was sealed off and declared a crime scene. Dr. Muhammad Ghaffer officially pronounced Anna dead at 2.19 p.m. on May 17, 2018. The Garda technical team arrived to carry out an examination. Detective Garda Owen Conway first photographed the scene. He took pictures of bloodied clothing as well as a blood-stained concrete block and a length of timber in the room where Anna was found. His colleague, Detective Garda Seamus O'Donnell, said there was a lot of rubbish in the room, and he catalogued anything he thought might be of probative value. The boys were excused from court during this evidence. Mr. Justice Paul McDermott told the jury he had agreed to an application to excuse them from court during her testimony. In the absence of the jury, defense lawyers Patrick Gaga BSC and Damian Colgan SC said their clients had found the previous few days very distressing. Each boy stayed outside the courtroom with a parent while the other stayed in court. Professor Cassidy said Anna was found dead in a derelict building a few days after she was reported missing. She was naked and there was evidence she had been violently assaulted in the building where she was found. Anna's body was taken from the scene to allow Professor Cassidy conduct a post-mortem. She found Anna Kriegel died due to blunt force trauma to the head and neck. Professor Cassidy also said there was evidence of penetration or attempted penetration of the vagina. The pathologist identified more than 50 areas of injury on the teenager's head and body. Professor Cassidy said there were four separate impacts to Anna's head.
She said they could have been caused by a heavy object with a small striking surface, or the corners of a larger object. However, she could not say what had caused these impacts. She said there was extensive hemorrhaging to the soft tissue of the neck and Anna would have asphyxiated due to compression of the neck structure. Professor Cassidy agreed, in cross-examination, that Anna suffered a very horrific death. Scientists at Forensic Science Ireland were examining the scene at Glenwood House as well as numerous exhibits taken from the scene. In his closing address, Mr. Grian said the forensic case against Boyer was overwhelming. John Hode, an expert in blood pattern and DNA analysis, said Anna was struck several times with a weapon as she lay on the floor in the derelict farmhouse. Anna bled from her injuries and Mr. Hode agreed there was quite an amount of blood, which matched the DNA profile taken from Anna during the post-mortem. Blood spatter on the wall indicated Anna was struck several times with a weapon in the corner on the left side as you entered the room. The blood pattern was just above the skirting board and this indicated Anna's head was in contact with the wall when she was struck. Saturation blood staining on the carpet indicated Anna lay in that position for some time after she was assaulted, though Mr. Hood could not say for how long. Anna's body subsequently moved or was moved to the back of the room, where her body was found. There were further blood spatter patterns on a wall at the back of the room, which were higher than the skirting board. These indicated Anna had been assaulted when she was upright at the back of the room, he said. In later evidence, Mr. Hood said a pair of boots worn by Boyer on the day Anna disappeared had her blood on them. Mr. Hood said there were nine separate areas of blood staining which were sampled for DNA and the DNA matched on us. Mr. Hood said some of the staining on the boots could be identified as blood spatter. This occurs when external force is applied to a source of liquid blood, which then falls on a surface. The blood spatter on Boye's right boot indicated Boy either assaulted and or was in very close proximity when she was assaulted. Mr. Hode told the jury. Gardy gave evidence of obtaining a warrant and searching Boye's home on May 24, 2018. During the search, Gardy took a total of 59 exhibits, including a backpack found in Boye's wardrobe. The backpack contained a mask, black woolen gloves, black plastic knee pads, black plastic shin pads, and a black woolen snood, what Gardy later described as the murder kit. Mr. Hode examined the backpack and its contents. There was blood staining on the inside and outside of the backpack, and the DNA matched Donna's DNA. Mr. Hood said there was blood staining on the mask and it too matched Donna's DNA. He examined the area around the nose and mouth of the mask for any DNA, and the mixed-profile DNA sample matched that of Anna and Boye. Anna's DNA was also found on blood on the knee pads and gloves. Dr. Charlotte Murphy, also from Forensic Science Ireland, looked for male-specific DNA on a neck swab taken from Anna. Dr. Murphy said this male-specific DNA matched Boye's DNA profile. The possibility of this DNA being from someone unrelated to Boye was 1 in 7,160, she said. By now, the forensic evidence was pointing Gardy in one direction. A week after Anna's body was found, Boye was taken to Klondauk in Garda Station and questioned on suspicion of the murder of Anna Kriegel. Over the next two days, Gardy conducted six interviews with Boye. In comparison to Boy B, who was practically loquacious, Boye didn't say much during the interviews. Asked about footage of a male walking in the park, and wearing gloves and a backpack, Boye said, I think that might be one of the lads who attacked me. Garda Tomas Doyle told Boye Gardy believed he was the male in this CCTV footage. Boye denied it was him. He said a statement he previously gave about being assaulted in the park by two men on the same day Anna disappeared was the truth. During one of the interviews, G.D.A. Doyle showed Boye a photograph of his boots, telling him Anna's blood had been found on them. Are you joking me? Boye asked. No, said G.D.A. Doyle. Are you actually being serious? Boye asked. G.D.A. Doyle said he wouldn't joke about something like that.
Boy then asked if he could get some air and he was handed a glass of water. GDA Doyle put it to Boy the blood on his boots put him in the room where Anna's body was found. Were you in this room? GDA Doyle asked. No, said Boy A. During the fifth interview, Boye was told Gardy had examined his mobile phone and retrieved data from a Safari search engine. Boye responded, That's not possible as I don't have Safari on my phone. An exhibit was shown to Boye. It was a screenshot of a list of videos saved on February 14, 2018 and included 15 most gruesome torture methods in history, horror movies that will blow everyone away, and 10 top. Sexiest video game characters of 2017. When asked what he was doing, Boy A said he was looking for horror movies online. This was an interest of his, specifically ghost horror movies, he said. Asked what he typed into the search engine, Boy A said, horror movies. A second printout was shown to Boy A. This data was also retrieved from his phone and included entries for Mega Mastodon, Creepy Forward Facing Skull, Printable Gift Vouchers, and Abandoned Places in Lucan. During the final interview, sections of Boy B's interviews with Gardy were put to Boy A. Asked if he wanted to make any clarifications, Boy A said, Boy B is lying, that's it. After 24 hours of questioning Boye was released from the provisions of his detention and charged with Anna's murder. As Gardy were interviewing Boye, Boy B was being interviewed in Finglas Garda station. He gave Gardy a number of different accounts of what happened. Gardy repeatedly urged Boy B to tell the truth. Boy B was released without charge and was subsequently rearrested six weeks later, on July 7. During those latter interviews, Boy B said Boy A asked him to call for Anna, citing relationship issues. They went to the park, and Boy B said he went into the house first, leaving Anna and Boy A outside. He went through the rooms and when he came out Anna and Boy A were talking. Boy B said Boy A and Anna then walked inside the house. He was told to leave by Boy A, but he didn't want to go. He then heard, shuffling, and he went and stood at the door of the room Boye and Anna had gone into. Boye B said Boye started stripping Anna and once he, Boye, got to her bra he looked up at Boye B and that's when he ran. He was released without charge, and following the directions of the DPP, he was charged with murder on July 12th. Following a seven-week trial at the Central Criminal Court, both boys have now been found guilty of murder. More on this story. Thank you.